All right, we're on air. Hey, everybody. It's Jamie Migdahl from Fetch Find, and I'm joined by three fantastic women. I'll let them introduce themselves because they're here and you can see them, but we're really excited about today's webcast. It's careers in the pet industry and you. And we felt like this was a really important thing to talk about because um, as all of my colleagues will tell you, people come to us on a regular basis asking about what it would be to get into the pet industry, how they can do it, um, what are the paths that we took um, or that people kind of commonly take. And, you know, it's, I found in my life that it's kind of the trail of breadcrumbs, meaning you have to follow things as they happen and sometimes you're off path a bit. Um, and really, you know, my belief system is that when you find good mentorship and good folks that you can, um, that you can bring into your life and learn from what they've done, that's really one of the best and most strongest ways to get some momentum in terms of your future. And so these three women today uh, Nicole, Amber, and Victoria are really, um, I think, exemplify that and are going to be able to give you some really fantastic information. And we're just going to have a conversation, the four of us. You can use the panel to chat. Um, everyone can see you. So you can see there's a little bit of um, people talking right now. So please go ahead and use that. We'll kind of do, you know, we're just going to kind of, we want this to be comfortable and conversational. So if there are things that you um, absolutely want to have answered and we don't get to them, go ahead and still log those questions. You can log them in the questions and answers part or you can log them into the chat. And if we don't get to them, then we'll go through them afterwards and respond to you individually. Or maybe what we'll do is we'll respond within the platform and you can go back and review those answers. And there's already some really good questions that people are asking. Let me take a look at them. Um, yeah, there's already some fantastic questions. So we'll, we'll get to those as we go through, but I think most importantly, and right now, I wanna go ahead and introduce um, the wonderful ladies of PET of Chicago. So starting, <laughs> so Nicole, actually, I think we'll do it by order of how long I've known you guys. I think that makes the most sense. Um, okay, so first and to my bottom, because we have a Brady Bunch thing going on. <laughs> I know, I love it. Hi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so first is uh, Nicole Stewart of Animal Sense. Nicole, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, wh and what you do with pets? Well, like Jamie said, my name is Nicole Stewart. Um, I uh, am a dog trainer, um, sort of that's the thing I've been doing the longest. Um, I, I run Animal Sense and um, teach private lessons and group classes, but also mentor the trainers that I have underneath me um, and, and guide them and help them along the way of their career path as, as they've been joining us and, and um, continuing doing group classes and private lessons for us. We also do a, um, a thing called Baby and Bowser, which is basically a seminar that we introduce how to adjust your dog to their incoming baby. So that's another seminar that's really a big part of our program. Okay, thanks. And how long, real quickly, how long have you been at, at the dog thing? At the dog thing? Uh, mm -hmm. I guess I just, uh, 17 years. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to keep track of these numbers so we can add up how many collective years we have. And also, um, is that 17 years? Did you, are you including any volunteer work that you did prior to starting working with Paul? Um, no, we're probably looking at more like 20. Okay. Because I think that's important when we're yeah, talking about sure. being a pet professional is thinking about the whole span of your career. Because yeah. I think for people who are watching, especially and are looking to get into the pet space, you know, if you're already doing volunteer work, whether that be once a week at PAWS or, um, you know, or you're, you've done some fostering or you go to the local aquarium and you help feed fish, I mean, any of those things I you're totally still... did not right? do that. You didn't do that. <laughs> I did not do that. Did you go feed fish at your local aquarium? I, I don't know. I don't know. No judgment, but um, <laughs> um, all right. So we've got 20 years for Nick. All right. So then next would be, we can look this way, would be uh, Victoria. Hi, Victoria. Welcome to our crowdcast today. I'm so glad that you're here. Hi. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, so I've been in the pet industry for about five years professionally. Uh, we're going into our sixth year now. And I own Sit Social, a dog lounge. So we do a variety of things. 
um, pet sitting, boarding, uh, doggy daycare, and then we also do unique pet focused events, which is a little bit different. Um, and how I got into pet care, so I actually do comedy, <laughs> and I moved to Chicago to do comedy, and long story short, I looked around and I, I wanted to do something that I love to supplement my comedy habit, and so that's why I started SIT. Um, it started as just dog walking, and then we've expanded over the years, and um, you know, it's definitely taken a leap of faith, but I'm glad that I did, and I get to do something I love every day, and I'm really happy about it, so. So I think that comment, so thank you so much. And I know Victoria well. She's also incredibly um, industrious and entrepreneurial. And that's one of the things that's drawn me to Victoria over the last several years. Um, but I think one of the things that you heard Victoria say is that she does something she loves every day. And, you know, that is certainly the myth the belief, the truth, and also the myth, the, 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 belief, wait, the belief and the truth, but the myth about working with pets. Um, and I think it depends on who you are and where you want to be and what you consider to be loving something every day, because um, I think we can all agree, can we all agree, that sometimes it's not easy every day. Um, yes. And so kind of pulling from, right? Everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I think that to be able to kind of step back, which I feel like, Victoria, you do really well, and to take kind of a, a more broad or global perspective or look at your life as it relates to working with pets, you, you really feel that way. I mean, you have like, you can't see me doing this. You really feel that way. Um, I mean, you do, and I think you really live it too. So, um, Thank you for saying that and making that clear, and we'll learn more about that as we go through our time today. And above you, that way, um, hey Amber, welcome to our yeah, exactly. <laughs> welcome to our crowdcast. And uh, so, all right, so tell about, let's hear about your space. So you are a groomer. You are yes. a groomer. So yes. let's hear let's hear about your background. Um, well, I've been grooming for nine years now, and I've been with the Bark Bark Club for about four years now. And I've uh, really been trying to expand the color, the hair dyeing business here. That is a lot of fun. It helps. Grooming is very stressful, so it's nice to have a little fun with the dog. How, so, is, groom how is grooming stressful? How would you, it's interesting that you're able just to say that and you obviously, mm -hmm. you know, that's the first place that you went. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's very personal with the dogs. I mean, we touch every inch of their bodies. There's nothing that we don't clean or brush or clip. So it's very intrusive and the dogs, they don't understand, they don't like it. So got to try to relax them as much as we can when we're squeezing things and clipping things. So <laughs> so is that stressful to you or do you think that's more stressful? To, are you picking up on the pet stress? Or are you picking up, is it your own stress walking into the situation when it is stressful? Um, maybe a little bit of both, depending on the situation of the dogs, because they do get really anxious and they don't know what's going on. Their owners just left them with us, which they love coming to hang out with us because we make it a very fun environment. But it is it is kind of scary for them with all the noises and things like that and water. A lot of dogs don't like getting baths, so. So do you see that in Victoria and Nicole, um, you know, hear, hear Amber talking about working with dogs and that stressful point. Because again, I want to get really real about working with animals. I don't want to, you know, this isn't a this isn't a sales pitch to come work with animals by any stretch. I think it's really a reality, a really good, strong look. And you women together, I think, are able to present all sides of the space. But I'm glad that we're already deep into like what the hard parts are. So, um, Victoria, what where do you see stress in animals, and how does that impact you in your life and your career? Um, yeah, so I think um, it can happen in a variety of ways. So obviously every pet has their own unique personality and also comes with their own set of unique traits and characteristics. So I think uh, more so we can see stressful situations when you're dealing with pets in in-home pet sitting scenarios, right? Because oftentimes the pets who require in-home pet sitting, it's for a reason. Maybe they don't get along with other dogs or there are other you know, behavioral issues that you're dealing with. Um, and so I think those stresses can sometimes play out on the job. Um, not always having like the perfect dog, the most well-behaved dog, um, and also having um, clients who are in denial about their dog's behaviors at times. That can be difficult, which I'm sure Nicole can probably speak to more, uh, dealing with all the training. But um, yeah, so I think that's stressful. And I think also, um, you know, this is 
pet care is a very people oriented business. You're not just dealing with the pets, you're dealing with all of their owners. And so you have to love people. Um, and I'm a people person, so it works well for me, but um, I definitely think that can be stressful too. There's, there are very high expectations of clients and being able to set boundaries and maintain those expectations and give the quality of service they're looking for and pricing and all of those things can be very stressful. So um, I would say, you know, dealing with difficult dog personalities and um, difficult human personalities and expectations definitely is stressful in this industry. And Nicole, and, and you're, I saw you nodding your head a little bit. How are you? I mean, 20 years. I mean, come on now. You've um, seen some stuff around, around all yeah. of these topics. Yeah, I think the biggest stress um, that we walk into every day is that there's like this idea that there's a magic pill that can make it all happen very, very quickly. And, um, and that, that is... Uh, you know, that is a disappointment that I bring to people on a regular basis. <laughs> I mean, it takes, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be terrible and hard when you're working with your dog and making them a great part of the family, but it isn't an overnight process. And right. I very much am a people person as well. So I get that desire for it to be an instant process. I would like it to be too. I feel like I would do so well if I had that, but I just don't. And, and so the expectations, meeting pet parent expectations is probably one of our biggest, or managing pet parent expectations. Mm. You know, and occasionally we have a person who is just in it to win it, gets it, is great. And those are golden clients, right? Those are golden. But most of my clients are normal people who like a dog is only one piece of their entire family that's happening. And so they would like it to happen fast. And so managing those expectations and helping them understand that it is a slow but steady process is probably the biggest stress. Once you get them on board, it's good, but it's that initial getting them on board. And then of course, when they find out, you know, maybe they don't have the dog that they they have a dog, but they don't have the one that's in their mind. And getting those two things to match is another little stress, if that makes sense. Um, it, yeah, I mean, of course it makes sense. And I see everyone nodding their head, of course. Um, yeah, I think that the toughest times working in pet, I think the, the toughest part of working in the pet industry is what you just described, actually. It's when you have enough experience, um, you are you are approaching every person, every animal with a certain set of your own expectations and your own understanding, and that's not something that you can easily transfer to a pet owner. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. So Amber, um, around the grooming situation, I would imagine that you probably deal a lot with, you probably can size up an animal and know what, what they need as far as their groom, as far as what they need, you know, whether it be like nails or anal glands or whatever it is, like whatever all those grooming, all those grooming things. I mean, you must be, we all need anal glands. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's so true. It doesn't need the anal gland cleaning. Um, you must, yeah, no, anyone in pet industry, even after all of these years, can we eat? We can't talk to my anal glands about laughing. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. Um, so when you see when you have someone walk into Bark Bark Club and you're like, oh my god, that dog totally needs a puppy cut, or I really want to keep that coat intact, or whatever it is, what? How do you manage that? Because I would be, I mean, you're an artist, right? At the core, you're an artist, and so you want to like transform pets and you want to make people happy at the same time. Oh, hi. Right. It's Wednesday. It's right. Wednesday. Hi, Wednesday. Um, oh, good. I'm glad that someone's got, that's awesome. Um, so what do you do in those situations? How do you defer or do you push when someone wants something that you know isn't right? Um, well, a lot of the times when that happens, the coat is matted or it's just not possible. Uh, the dematting process, if there's a lot, um, we try to explain to them and let them know um, that it's painful and that even though they want their dog to have this long, beautiful coat for the look of it, they just have to take care of the coat. So we try to tell them that what's best for the pet and try to explain how painful it can be because sometimes I think the clients, they really just, they don't understand that when it is matted, if we demat it, I mean, we're we have to break through it and it pulls the hair and it is, it's stressful for the dogs because 
they don't understand that they didn't have their hair brushed for three months and now we have to pretty much, I mean, it sounds bad, but we have to almost like rip through the matted hair. So we just try to educate them and also inform them, you know, if we have to shave this time, let's come back in four weeks, we'll do a brush out and we can work on this coat. Let's just start from scratch and make it better. So that brings up a whole other conversation about money um, and about clients and about charging for services. So in this situation, Amber, you just described that you have a client come in and they, and by the way, that was, a, I appreciate you going through that, kind of sharing that experience and going through and also a nice education piece for everyone too. I, I have colleagues, I never think about the matting, but you're absolutely right. Anyhow, um, I know that Victoria has little 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 no coat dogs, and 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 Nicole has a Commodore who's got. You have, does she, does Finley ever met? Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, I would imagine. He's groomed every four weeks. <laughs> right. Oh, he is. Nice. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, I actually have to know. You go to that place over on um on, on Lake Street, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. So. Uh, so when, you're, when, when you have this dog, I'm going to actually, I'm going to mute you for a second, Amber, because I know you're a Bark Bark Club right now, and we can all oh, hear the bark. Sorry. No, sorry there's the bark. That. <laughs> actually, the Bark Bark, the bark, <laughs> bark right? Um, so um, when you have a client come in and, and you service them, and you always are doing things with an ethical, obviously ethical, ethic, ethics being for, at the forefront, forefront of everyone here, your minds, what do you, how do you, do you struggle at all with charging people for money, charging people money for things that you know that they need, that if they don't get, they're going to be, their animals will suffer um, or their life will suffer? And, and, and not talking about whether they can afford it or not, just talking about that you're providing a service to someone who you, know, you would probably want to do in some ways, in some cases anyway. Um, because you're animal lovers and you're kind people and you're generous of heart. Is there ever a situation or does it happen often that you have that you do struggle with charging money for something that is a passion for you? Nicole, I'd throw that to you first. Well, that's an interesting question. I, um, I think that it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then, <sighs> yes. So the answer is it used to be, but now I am very comfortable with, with charging people for my knowledge and my expertise. But I do think that I got more comfortable the more years I had under my belt. Um, because there's a, I, I, I don't know how you two feel about it. I feel like my particular end of the pet business is very, um, we have a lot of different people with a lot of different methods and a lot of different results oriented um, ends that people are looking to get. And it can be, it can seem like you're not accomplishing something um, when you're in their house, let's say, and you're, you've gone over and their dog has just, um, let's not talk like puppies, because I feel like I can make good progress on that. But like something that's a behavior problem that takes a little bit more time, that first session, maybe that second session, it's not like obvious what we've accomplished. So it's, I find that to be I less now because now I really, um, the, the amount of years under my belt has been, it's been easier. But in the very beginning, I felt like they needed to see a result every time I was there. And so that's where I got in that trouble of, of charging money. Now I have, I have less of a problem with it now because my expertise and my knowledge behind me, um, they, they need that. And I, I feel confident about that. But definitely in the beginning, that was a tricky piece for me. Yep, I totally get that. Victoria, what about you? Um, yeah, I definitely don't have a problem charging for what <laughs> I'm doing. Um, it's never been an issue for me. And I think actually I've seen a lot of, so I'm friends with a lot of other um, pet care and pet industry owners, business owners here in Chicago. And um, I do see that as a big problem a lot of times because we are oftentimes very kind, generous people. And so you know, because of that, we often don't have boundaries, I would say, and, and being able to say, you know, and, and I also think we live in an age where, you know, customer service is everything, right? And you in the the best customer service, that's what you're aiming for in every business. And so oftentimes, people think that means going above and beyond without charging for that going above and beyond. Um, and so I, I haven't struggled with it. Personally, um, 
I have no problem increasing our rates when we need to. Um, I have no problem finding those little upsells. So, you know, extra services or things that the clients are getting, or if it's something that's inconveniencing me on a regular basis, then you bet your butt. I'm going to be like, all right, we need to charge for this. Sure. You know, you can book your pet the same day, but you're going to pay for that. Sure. You know, so just looking at those things and saying, okay, Yes, I understand you want this, but that's a premium because it's an inconvenience to me and my time. And so therefore, you know, I am going to have to charge you for that. So you're bringing up a really good point, which I actually, when I introduced you and, and mentioned what I really appreciate and admire about you is your sense of entrepreneurship. Um, and I think that in the pet space, entrepreneurship and pet industry, those two terms aren't so um, obviously linked or um, kind of cross Across, uh, there's not so much of a hybrid in thinking from people who are either um, clients of, you know, consumers don't necessarily think of pet care professionals as being entrepreneurs. And I'm talking about obviously the business owners, but anyone that runs their own book of business, like Amber, I know you must run your own book of business, and that requires a tremendous amount of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking. Um, where do you think? And I think it's becoming more and more prevalent that there is a stronger tie to when you start a pet business, you can identify as an entrepreneur. But Victoria, when you started um, Sit Social, did you did you go into it as a pet lover or as a business owner? Um, I think both. Like I definitely, um, I grew up around. Uh, my mom is very entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. so I think I sort of absorbed that growing up and. Um, not even consciously, but literally just kind of being like, I want to make my own income and I want to do something I like. And so what's something I can do here in Chicago? Um, and that's how it was born for me, where I'm not sure if that's everyone's path, um, but I think I came at it, I would say probably 80% entrepreneur, 20% pet lover. And that's not to say I don't, I love dogs, <laughs> love, love, love given. dogs. But I do think that for me, I look at it as a business. And, you know, some people when they're starting or if you're thinking of leaving your current job to start, you know, a pet uh, business, um, I think some people, maybe this is their dream and they want to work with the animals for the next 20, 30 years. For me, I looked at it as, okay, this is something I love doing. And eventually I want this business to be passive income where I'm just sort of checking on it, you know, maybe a couple hours a week. Um, and then I can move on to the next thing. And I think Jamie is a, is a serial entrepreneur as well, loves to bounce around with different ideas and go to the next business. Um, and that's definitely how I am as a person and my perspective. So, so do you, so Amber, let's, so thanks for that. It was a really um, honest and, and, uh, you know, an answer that I really respect, I can really respect and also really, um, I, I really quickly, Amber, before I ask you or before we bring it over to you, I do want to say that I just had a realization, I had an aha moment just now um, through your through your talking and your telling of your perspective and, and where you come from. So I think when I got into the pet industry in 25 years ago, I think I came into it never never thought about owning a business or being a manager or scaling a company or being an entrepreneur. None of those words. I didn't, I, I still can't spell entrepreneur, but I knew for sure I didn't even know what it was at that point. Um, and so as I have gone through in my career, I've now for the first time, really like a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I've now owned um, some of those things that you so brilliantly stated and held on to. I now feel like that's my goal. I I love animals. It's a no. It's it's like you shouldn't even have to say. It's like I love breathing. You know, like really do you? That's great. Um, it's an assumed, but I really uh, I am in a place in my career, in my life that I really um, am and so passionate about entrepreneurship and growing a business and scaling a business and having an income and being able to support myself and my staff and my family with something that I really am good at and that I enjoy doing. But I really am looking at this from you know from a very different perspective than just just only being with the animals all day long. So I, I just have that, um, I just kind of have that moment of self-awareness. So thank you for giving me the, the path to that. Um, all right, so Amber, Amber, to you. What about you? I mean, I think when people go into grooming, isn't, the, isn't it kind of the assumption, from my experience with groomers at this point in my career, I feel like, and maybe Victoria and Nicole, you may have the same thing. I'd be curious to see your perspective on this. But I always think of groomers as being artists first, um, entrepreneur second and employees third. Um, that's just the way that I, I've always perceived um, that career path or that kind of that makeup. What, do you agree or disagree with that? What is your, what's your sense? Yeah. Does entrepreneurship I, fit in? 
Yeah, I would agree with that because um, even though I do, I am an employee of the Bark Bark Club, what I'm doing is very personal. Um, I have clients that come to me specifically because of what I do and how I care for their animals. So it's how I do my job and how I present myself. So that does make it very, even though I do work for this business, I, I am my own person here that people want to come to. I build my reputation with my skills and things like that. So I think that that order is correct. Do you consider sure. yourself, I mean, is that, so do you look at yourself as being artist, entrepreneur, employee? And that's, of course, we know you love Bark Bark. This isn't about putting them last. It's more yeah. about, it's more about you as a pet professional, not representing a particular yeah. organization, but is that how you kind of feel when you, when you approach your career, if you're taking a couple of steps back and looking at it from a 30,000 perspective, 30,000 30, perspective? Absolutely. I mean, I do, uh, I do think of myself as an artist too, and especially with the pet dying now, it's really letting me blossom with, I like to do fun haircuts too, different styles with mohawks and booties and stuff like that. So it is, I would say that I am an artist. It is a lot of sculpting and shaping, so. It's cool. I gotta tell yeah. you, I gotta tell you, Nicole, I think you and I have talked about this a couple of times. I, I've worked in every aspect of pet, um, as many of us have. I was sheltering, boarding and daycare, veterinary, dog walking, pet sitting, training, education, B2B, B2C, the whole thing. Sorry, I live in Chicago. There's a thing going by. <laughs> um, I live. I live. Everyone's dying. It's a siren in Chicago. No way. Um, so I, I've never worked um, as a groomer. I have never bathed the dog professionally. I've never... I've never squeezed an anal gland. I've never, um, <laughs> back to that. Um, I've never done some of those, those grooming. And I, I always think about grooming as being that one segment of the pet industry that's so, so highly specialized. And, mm -hmm. um, and also like the part, the one career in the pet industry that if you go down that path, you really can always have a job and name your price and like, I always Absolutely. say you can go groom, groom dogs on Hawaii. Uh, you know, you can go groom dogs on a beach if you want to. Um, oh, I think, <laughs> I know, you're like, well, wait a minute, maybe this whole dog <laughs> grooming thing, I didn't think about this. Um, and so I do think that there's a difference between, and I do, I, I don't know, Nicole, what do you think? Do you, how do you feel about, like, the, and when you think about the verticals, the different types of verticals, how do you per perceive dog walking or veterinary or grooming as compared to your own, where the lane that you've chosen? In comparison to? I, um, I maybe in comparison to, how do you perceive them? So, like, as a pet professional, you're a dog trainer and a very, very renowned, um, you know, very um, experienced and expert in your field. Thank you. Yes, I know you're renowned. You are. Um, <laughs> you run a national training business, so yes, you are. Um, when you look at like dog walking, pet sitting, veterinary grooming, um, do you ever? I guess the question is, do you ever wish that you followed one of those paths or included one of those paths in your in your repertoire? I think if anything, um, I mean, I, 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 I. So before I became a dog trainer, I was like, I'm gonna go be a vet. <laughs> Like, I'm going to go be a vet. And then I realized that's, I don't love blood. And love blood. I mean, like, no, like, it's a thing for me. Like, it's not, it, it's gotten better since I've had kids. But my mom was like, really? That's how that, how's that going to work? And then, um, and so, so I think if I was going to talk about it, that was the one thing. But as I've been in this, this particular business for longer, um, I feel like I'm glad I didn't go that route. Um, because I think I find behavior so interesting and I'm always sort of surprised, um, how little vet school really goes into it from a very basic. I mean, I know they can go further into it by choice, but I mean, I've just been really um, into it mean behavior behavior and yeah, yeah, going into like their behavior classes are, I believe electives or they used to be, I don't know if they still are, but I really love the behavior piece of it. I think it's so interesting. That said, um, my groomer, like, I don't know what I would do without my groomer. Right. So, and so Me it's too. like, Me too. I, I mean, really because of the dog that I have, um, it is like a, it's like a, a thing that I rely on and a, a, a service that is important to me. And I really trust that person. And I think that's a huge piece. And I would say, you know, the trust becomes such a big 
a big aspect of grooming, but also of where you leave your dog when you're gone. I mean, you know, there's, there's all those aspects. I have such a giant respect for the industry and the pieces that are incorporated and, and all the entrepreneurs that have built their, their place in the pet world. Cause mm -hmm. it's all very um, important to a pet owner. A pet owner needs to be able to trust their people who provide them services like that. Wow. I love what you just said um, that, that you have that, that you hold that perspective and that you hold that respect for all of the different pieces, especially because when you're in the pet industry, right guys, like when you're, or ladies, when you're in the pet industry, it's easy to get a little bit jaded or a little bit like assumptive around certain things, but to be able to really be a professional it, that, that, that what Nicole just said is I think separates the professionals, the true professionals from maybe the hobbyists or the enthusiasts to really like be in the space and look around and say, wow, people are building products and services that are making the life of my animal better. And I respect every part of that. Not to say that pet owners and pet enthusiasts and hobbyists don't hold that. But I think when you're in it every day and you hold that, that's a really, um, it's a really respectful, respectable uh, kind of mindset to have. What about you, Victoria? Have you, when you think about your business and growing your company, because I think scale is really important to you. Um, and, and again, just kind of going back to the entrepreneurship thing, thinking about your future. Well, are there areas in pet that you see yourself wanting to expand into and why or why not? Yes, I think that um, in this day and age to be competitive in the pet space, people are really looking for a one-stop shop. You know, they want to come, they would love, you know, to your point, Nicole, there's so many aspects like what Amber does in grooming and wanting training and, you know, people want all these things for their pets, a good pet owner, a pet lover, somebody who wants the best for their animal, for the life of the animal. Um, so we definitely are interested in that. I would say um, less so on the front that I'm going to go <laughs> become a certified trainer and a groomer and all those things. But I would love to partner with um, you know, other entrepreneurs who are doing things of that nature and finding ways to scale and grow like a one-stop shop together. So um, yeah, and I think for me too, from the entrepreneur perspective, it's really about merging my passions with pets. And so my passions are like, I love people. I love hosting people. That's why we're doing these pet focused events like doggy singles night and paint your pets portrait class and you know, just really fun, unique things that I feel infuse my personality and the things that I love and have skill sets in with um, the pets that I love, right? And bringing community together and building community for people. Um, so I think all the verticals are important and I think a smart business person recognizes that. Mm -hmm. And I think you see it more and more, especially here in Chicago, that most places are trying to be a one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. we, you wanna offer them everything. Yeah, we can train your puppy and we can groom your puppy and we can board your puppy and we can do everything for your dog. So what do you recommend then? What would be your suggestion or recommendation? So someone who's listening right now and there are 30 people, um, so, and, and this will be shared far and wide. So let's just assume that hundreds of people will have access to the next words you're going to say. Um, okay. No pressure. Um, no no pressure. pressure. And this is going to be a question I ask everyone. So just hold on. Victoria's just going first. Um, so what would be your recommendation to somebody right now who is sitting in front of their computer with their headphones on listening to the three, the four of us, you know, talk about these things. What, Someone's like, okay, this is all really great, ladies, and I totally get that you've been doing this 20 years and nine years and da 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 da. But what do I do to start? Like, what do I do? I just know I want to work mm -hmm. with animals, and I'm not sure what that means exactly, but I'm sick of my cubicle, and I just want to run through the poppy seeds with golden retrievers nipping at my heels. What, like, mm -hmm. where, where do I start if I want that to be my reality? What is your recommendation to that person? So what I would recommend is, um, I think an exercise that's helpful is to envision your perfect day. And what does that look like from start to finish? I think that's a good place to start. Um, what time do you want to wake up? What do you want to be doing with animals? Do you want to be training and educating owners of animals like Nicole is? Do you want to be styling and being an artist with animals like Amber does? Do you want to be taking care of pets when they're away and, and you're a caretaker, you know, like my company does, or doing events with pets because that's something that you like? Um, so I think really envisioning your perfect day from start to finish. What time do you wake up? How much work are you doing? Are you working three hours a day, 10 hours a day? Do you love working? Like, what does that look like for you? And then um, I think that's step one. And then I would say step two would be, you know, deciding, do you want to invest money up front? So Nicole and Amber, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> and fortunately in the pet care space, um, there's no real requirements for 
for someone to board other than getting a license or you know taking care of these pets so if you're going to be a groomer you've got to go through the training if you're going to be a dog trainer you have to go through the training so are you willing to invest and take that time away from your job do you have the money to invest in that up front um, and start there and then kind of work your way into running your own business um, in my case you know I started with a website and some postcards and I went out and it was really about marketing and sales to get clients in obviously I educated myself on um, pet care uh, professionalism and important aspects of animal behavior which I think is important um, but yeah I would say start with your perfect day and then I think this is a good conversation because there are different verticals here that are talking so you can think about which one looks like it would fit your perfect day um, do you want to set your own prices as a groomer and have, you know, work a few hours and then go be on the beach all the rest of the day? Or do you want to be surrounded by puppies and old dogs and all types of dogs and be in your own doggy daycare all day long? You know, so again, I think it's up to each individual, but what does that look like for you? So listen, this is, um, and, and I'll just tell anyone who's, who, everyone who's listening and watching, we did no scripting of this whatsoever. This is a really organic conversation. In fact, I sent out a document. Um, earlier in the week that just were going to be some obvious questions like tell us about how you got into the pet industry because we needed to you know start the conversation flowing and going and I really do love this direction um, and I think that so I have a huge bias and I can't pretend that I don't and so we'll just get that out there and I think Nicole has shares that same bias um, which is that education is exceedingly important when you're working with pets and animals in fact if I, own, I happen to um, be the founder and CEO of a company that that is our entire mission is educating the pet industry. Um, every person who works in the pet space, whether you're working as an apprentice groomer or you're working as a, um, you know, you're the you're a facility owner of a facility that has 15, 20 locations and 500 employees. And we really strongly believe that training is the cornerstone to making to professionalizing our industry and professionalizing an industry has a lot of different variables to them to it one of the things is de-risking people and their pets and the employees that work with those pets and education is really the most cost effective and most efficient way of de-risking a business and de-risking the individuals within that business so you know again you know just we didn't set it up to have this part of the conversation flow that way but i'm going to take the moment to just say that and be really and 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 really emphasize that if you're looking to get into the pet space get yourself educated and like victoria just said and like nicole was nodding and amber was nodding you know you don't need to do that i mean that's the reality if you want to work with pets so you can go get, get a business card done today i did that in 1994 I got a dog I, I named a company out you go I went to the local printer because um, in 94 you went to the local printer um, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't do like this to print or I move or anything cool like that and you and I and I started walking people's dogs my first client was a veterinarian in fact um, who's still a good friend today um, but point is that you know here's a veterinarian right who said here's a leash and my house keys and my two prized German shepherds I'm a 24 year old kid really who's walking around with these two beautiful animals on my leash with zero I mean I worked in shelters and I did some work in a vet I did I had some experience certainly before I did this that's how I, I, I tested this out a little bit I worked in a veterinary clinic and animal shelters Lincoln Park Zoo but point is that I had nothing as far as certifications as far as professional education as far as anything that would really qualify me to be in that in that role servicing that pet um, and that stays and that stands true today um, and with yeah and I think I think that's a, a negative I would say too in our vertical yes. is that we are one of the only verticals I mean sure any person could say I'm a groomer I'm a trainer I'm a this or that and it's up to you as the pet owner to do that's your right. research but I think especially when it comes to pet care yeah. I mean look at Roper. I was just gonna right? say that it's that's just, exactly right I was gonna exactly you know, know I was ju you just took the yeah. rover out of my mouth yeah. <laughs> but it's so, and I think that's a negative because to your point, I think education is important and, um, you know, not to, to, I'm honestly plugging FetchFind that we've used this for our staff. We have videos. I actually am, um, <laughs> I, I work with a, so every summer we do a youth summer employment program where we bring in um, youth from different charities and there's grant money and we mentor them and they're coming in today actually. And I'm going to have them sit down and watch the FetchFind videos. That's their start that's before so they awesome. touch any dog, before they do anything, they need to understand the basics of animal behavior and how dogs interact and all of those things are very important and unfortunately there is in our vertical there is no requirement for any company to have to go through that 
Um, so it really is up to the individual and I hope that changes in the future, you know, but, but that's the way it currently And it stands, doesn't look like so. it's changing anytime soon because really what we're seeing is with the gig economy, it's actually making it more and more, it's making it more accessible and more easy to get into the pet industry mm -hmm. without having to do any type of education. And again, it really, if, if, if you, nothing else for folks that are looking to get in or expand their current space in the pet space, or current, you know, um, avenue, whatever, whatever you're doing and you want to do more of it. I mean, de-risking is really important. There are 4 million, sorry, almost 5 million dog bites at, reported annually in this country, according to the CDC, that's the Center for Disease Control. And each one of those dog bites carries um, a financial liability of $40,000 per occurrence. So, and that's obviously across all of those millions of dog bites, but if you just kind of wrap your head around the billions of dollars that are in losses from dog bites, in, in, my, in my opinion, and this is an opinion, I don't have any statistical findings to back this up, but with education, even an hour or two of education for, for all of those victims, um, I, I would assume, I would hope, assume, expect that we would see some reduction in that number, even by, you know, by a hundred thousand, even a hundred thousand less people to get bit. I mean, that's a that's a really big number when you start breaking it down like that. Mm -hmm. And so education is so absolutely essential, and it's how we're going to be able to really save this industry, in my opinion, because education will start to help pet owners understand that Victoria trains her staff, that Nicole is a certified pet professional. Is it C is CP? Is I forgot. Are we calling it a pet or professional? So, you mean a CPDT? Yeah, what is it now? Certified both have... professional yeah. dog yeah. trainer. Okay, so that, that's the... Um, that's the, oh, no, that's it, the it, it used to be pet dog trainer, right? That's yeah, professional. Anyway. All right, okay. well, anyway, so there's a CPDT. In grooming, let's talk about the education in grooming. Um, there's obviously a ton of grooming schools out there. I assume there's a lot of... On, I know there's a lot of on-the-job training um, what do you tell somebody who says, you know what, I want to have a career where I'm making six figures, making my own schedule, I can train dogs, I can groom dogs in, on the beaches of Hawaii, I can be my own boss, I can move anywhere in the world and guarantee myself a job because I do believe that's what grooming has to offer more than a lot of the other verticals. Um, what, do you, what, do you tell people, um, what do you tell people about how to start? Um, well... The way well, I was trained, I was uh, trained through Petco, and it it was it was a, it was nice training. Um, but I had to be a brusher bather first, so you start with the very basics of it and see how you feel about that bathing the dogs, and then they just slowly start teaching you the little things like shaving paw pads and doing nails and sanitary trims, and just like slowly going into it because it's. I mean, it, it can be very dangerous. You are using very sharp, sharp shears, to, and they're moving constantly. So, <laughs> and they have sharp, sharp tools too. <laughs> they do, mm -hmm. and that's the um, having knowing the signs of aggression and like if they're afraid, if they're going to bite you, and you're going to certain areas, and also having the equipment to if you need to restrain them, which I. Uh, Working at the Bark Bark Club, I had never seen this kind. Normally, as a groomer, you just put a muzzle on a dog. But the Bark Bark Club, they have these really cool foam collars that you put on. It's kind of like if you get into a car accident, those uh, foam. Mm -hmm. So that's what we put around their neck. So they're not being, they don't have anything around their mouth. It's just they can't turn and bite us. And I wish I could see more of that in the grooming industry because muzzles, I feel, just aggravate them more. But these collars, they're they're gentle. They're not. They can still pant. I wish those were out on the market. Actually, I don't even know their actual name. Patty, the owner of the Bark Bark Club, she's had them for years, and I think she got them at a trade show. But there's no. They don't look like they were from like a professional business. It might have been like a small. But it's just educating and having the right tools too. They're coming up with a lot of things that help with grooming, but. Just getting into it and trying it, I guess, not just jumping into it, just getting your toes wet and seeing how you like the struggle, I guess. <laughs> so that's actually, um, I'm going to just, I'm going to insert something else again. This is a totally unscripted conversation. The way that it's flying is really beautiful. Um, so I work closely with PetSmart. Um, we have a pet fetch find has a really great relationship with their grooming department. Um, mm -hmm. We do a lot of work in helping them with their, you know, just with helping 
helping them to identify great people who should be in the grooming program. And we've been spending some time actually at their grooming school and with their grooming instructors and with their curriculum. And, um, and what I've seen over the last, I think we've been working with them for, I don't know, three, four, five months now. And what I've seen and what my team has seen is that a curriculum like the PetSmart Grooming Academy curriculum may be very similar to what your Petco curriculum is. I'm not familiar with the Petco curriculum. Um, that that's a really fabulous way for someone to start down the path of working with pets. That yeah. getting, and I actually, I actually, Nicole, I think you and I may have talked about this. I don't remember if it was you and I, or maybe um, whatever. I actually had just said to someone, thinking it was maybe Nicole, that had that been available to me, a school like PetSmart, where they actually pay for you to go through that education and it's a really robust mm -hmm. curriculum. Mm -hmm. I probably, if I knew that was, if I knew it existed and I, you know, if I knew it existed, because I didn't know, actually, I had no idea. I may have even done that in the beginning. I don't think, I didn't want to be a groomer, and that's no offense to groomers, of course. I, you know, I had a different path in my life, but that would have been a great way to at least start down the path and learn about pets. And, like, I feel like groomers, like, they know dogs. I mean, they really know dogs. Um, so interesting for you to talk about how you got there and then to make people aware that, Education is really important, especially for a groomer. We're quite honestly, let's be honest, right? To be a dog walker, you can't just like I did and like you have, and many of our you know friends and colleagues have done hundreds of them, thousands, tens of thousands worldwide. You can't grab a leash and a prayer and be okay, um, but you certainly can't you know you certainly can't do that uh, as a groomer, and you certainly can't do that as a trainer. And you you can, but oh my goodness, should you not? Yeah. Um, so let's talk about some education about training. So now we're talking, we've talked about, um, we talked about, you know, just some general how to get into the pet space. We've talked about some of these different verticals, training, pet sitting, dog walking, grooming. Nicole, I feel like a lot of people think of being a dog trainer, and I think Cesar Milan probably really romanticized this. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, that gave me the chills when I said yeah, that. Really um, yeah, yeah, and not in a good way. <laughs> no. not a good way. So <laughs> by the way, everybody, did you see how all pet professionals just responded to the Cesar Milan thing? You see how we did that? We're not going to talk about it, but you saw what happened. Nicole, I seem okay. to have lost your video, so if you can hear me still go ahead and just refresh your screen um, and I'm gonna talk can you hear me though I can hear you fine and I I'm on I, uh, can anyone else see Nicole no okay so we can't see you but we can hear you so we're gonna go with that I'm gonna um, hold on okay. see? no All right that's okay but here I'll have, I'll have you answer this question and then maybe we can re do a refresh on your screen so what do what do you recommend when someone says I want to be a dog trainer um, well, I think, um, f for me, I'm always trying to lead them towards, um, education as well. I mean, I feel like we've just spoken about a lot of the things that I would recommend. Um, but it really, it, it's so important that they start with that. And I see a lot of people who come to me and they've like, they just really love dogs and they've taught, trained their own dog and that's a great start. Um, but it's, you've got to go get some, I didn't have the availability of like a formal training program like that. Just some of them existed, but nothing really in like positive reinforcement. It just wasn't really a thing. No, it wasn't it, there. No, wasn't the there. way that I did it was, um, Paul Owens um, was running a program, but it was me and him giving me tests and books and things to read. And then I literally was his shadow for a year straight on everything he did. Um, and that was an amazing experience, by the way. And, I, and, and, and it was something that I did pay for, um, but it was different than like a curriculum, which I feel like I mean, Fetch Find has, which is, is amazing. And, and there are several other places that do as well, but we, we work with Fetch Find a lot, um, being in Chicago and everything. And it's just, it's really important that they get that foundation of dog behavior first. And it's, if you get that foundation, then you decide, hey, am I in, still interested? Because it's so much more knowledge than some people might, get, might decide, you know what, this isn't for me. This, this, this isn't for me. If I have to know all of this background about dogs, maybe this isn't for me and that's okay. But it is for you in order to go into someone's home and then to pay you the kind of money that they can pay, you have to know what you're talking about. And so education for me is first and foremost. 
All right. So I think that we all are all, are we all on the same page about this education thing? Again, this is not, uh, <laughs> this is not, I did not pay anyone to talk about how important education is, even though I own an education company, but it is really important. And I think it will, I think it will start to, I think it will breed, no pun intended, I think it'll breed um, stronger and better pet professionals as we move forward because I do think education will come become, you know, I think it'll become just the expected, not just the exception um, as we move as we move into the next couple of years and decade of pet professionalism. Um, but what, I mean, I guess, let's just, let's just assume that people are like, yeah, yeah, the education I'll get to and I get to, but I really wanna to start today. Right, because let's just face it, that's unfortunately part of it. Rover.com, right, for your, to your point, Victoria. Rover.com, which, listen, I am, I, I get why Rover.com Rover exists. In fact, I know that there are great pet sitters who are bonded and insured who do use that platform for customer acquisition, which means finding new people to take care, finding new, finding new customers. They are using that and they're doing it well. Um, but what do you say to somebody who goes, you know what, this is all fine and lovely, Jamie and Victoria and Amber and Nicole. I get it. You guys have all of this, you've, of a, of a mass, you've amassed you know, 50 plus years of experience working with pets. I, however, I don't have the time or money or the really right now the interest in applying myself in an educational program because I'm not sure if this is even something I want to do. I want to just start exploring it right now. Um, what is your top two recommendations to that person who for sure don't even bother saying go get educated because it's just not going to happen unfortunately what are the two things you say to that person i'll start with you um, after i turn your mic on amber um so what what do you say to that person who says i want to groom dogs but i'm not going to get educated what do you think i should do amber uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah right yeah, i know um, right um you don't want to get educated maybe just volunteer and just maybe just see what's going on. Shadow, talk, maybe talk to some groomers. Um, if you, yeah, really, I mean, you just need to get educated about what it actually is and what you actually have to do. Because a lot of the times when I tell people that I am a groomer, their first response is, oh, you get to play with dogs all day. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was all of it. It's, so, I mean, really, I, I mean, I really don't know what else to say other than getting educated because you're just going to be disappointed or have expectations that are not real that come with this profession. So, or trick, all of, all so of really the a, a trick question is what you're saying. That was a, yeah. that was a sucky <laughs> question, Jamie. Why would you ask me that? Why do I have to go first? All right. So let me thank you, Amber. Um, let me ask I know, you, I know. Victoria. Oh, okay. You know? All right. No, fine. Go. You raise your hand. Oh. You go. Go ahead. <laughs> go. Go. Can you, can you yeah. Me? Huh? I can, can see, you guys see me now. Yeah. Oh, I can see oh, you. oh, I'm sorry. I, th I didn't know you knew that. Oh, I was back. Oh my okay. God. You've been, you've been back for a long time. Oh, good, good. Um, okay. So, uh, I would say go volunteer at a shelter and like get your, ha get your hands, um, respectfully on dogs and be around everything that a dog is and does, um, and have that experience without having to, um, is being a volunteer, you know, and just get yourself there. And then um, go to, um, if you wanted to be a trainer, this is coming from a trainer perspective, if you wanted to be a trainer, go find a trainer and um, see if you can shadow them or volunteer for them or just, you know, spend a week following and finding out what they do. And, you know, they might might be willing to do it, but you've got you've to gotta find out what goes into it before you decide that's what you want to do. Agreed. Victoria? Um, go work at rover.com. No, <laughs> um, so I would say, you know, there's really, I think, a couple ways you can go about it. I mean, I definitely do think education is important, no matter whether you're, you know, it's not good to learn as you go. I'll just tell you that it's going to be a painful process if you do that. You want to educate yourself before you get started. And I think assessing your personality type, too, because to Amber's point, right, they're saying, oh, with groomers, you play with dogs all day. And at a dog daycare, you play with dogs all day. And you're a dog trainer, you play with dogs all day. So it's like, regardless of the vertical, people have this assumption in the general public. And I think it's really understanding who you are as a person and again going back to that where do you see yourself what does your perfect day look like like do you want to be isolated in a room with just dogs and nobody around 
Maybe you want to be a groomer. Are you an artist? Maybe you want to be a groomer. Are you somebody who loves to teach? Maybe you want to be a trainer, right? So I think thinking about those things too, um, who you are, and then I agree with the other points like shadowing or, or volunteering, or even get a part-time job on the weekends at some of these, you know, yeah. temporarily, just check it out. Like, and I have to be honest, I did not do any of that. So I'm speaking from somebody who Wait, literally was on. just like- Nope, I disagree with you. I'm gonna hearken you back to five years ago on my couch. Um, yes. That's true. So I did, I did seek out, I did seek out knowledge, but I think, yes, no, you know, but, and, and I did, then you cannot just, you can't gloss over that because that's not you, what your statement was, was not accurate. It's not like a representation of how you got into this. You came to me with your little sit hat on at, you know, the, what was then the canine link office. And you were like, I want to be a dog walker. What do I do? So, I mean, that was not just you know, getting a business card made at your local printer and going and grabbing a leash. You did think about it. You did seek out professional help and mentorship. So, all right, I'll let you continue, but I'm not going to let you say that you did nothing. <laughs> okay, that's true. I, I, Jamie's right. I did definitely, I sought out my own knowledge. I'm just saying, I guess, as someone who doesn't come from money and I don't just, you know, I'm not a doctor or lawyer that left my job and had a couple hundred thousand Fair sitting enough. in the bank Fair to enough. just start my idea. Because, you know, many people have so that for, situation, as you know. <laughs> well, some people do. No, you're right. Um, or they have parents or friends, friends and family who can support them. Yeah. Um, I'm somebody who built everything from the ground up myself, and um, I did have to be resourceful. Luckily, um, there are ways to get educated. I did volunteer with Paws here in Chicago, um, so you know I did learn some things in ways that didn't cost me money. And I think if you are thinking about getting into this before you know quitting your job and cashing in your 401k and, you know, saying, oh, I'm going to open up this doggy bakery or whatever it is, really make sure you've dabbled in the industry a little bit before you do it. I think that's, that's key. And understand your personality. Like, who do you want to be as the business owner? Because you are, <laughs> you're going to run a business. The entrepreneur piece does come into it. And you have to be able to do all of the, you know, the business side of things. If that's not part of who you are, then maybe, again, what does your day look like? Do you want to be managing 10 people? Do you want to just be working for yourself and only you? You know, like those are questions I think that are really important if you're thinking about getting started. So I wouldn't say just like jump into something, um, really think it through and, and ask yourself those important questions because, um, again, you know, I could be just a dog walker making like 60, 70 K a year walking dogs five days a week and I could have no employees underneath me and just be doing my own thing. And if that's what you want to do, then, you know, so it's like thinking about what your dream is and then going in that direction. But if you're thinking about owning and operating a business, a company, you are going to have to experience a lot of business education as well. So it's not just educating yourself about the pets, mm -hmm. but educating yourself about business, about the taxes, about the QuickBooks, about the, you know, all those pieces, you know, HR, how do you manage a team of people? And if you're thinking of, of doing a dog walking company, I'll tell you right now, that will become an HR nightmare. <laughs> just something, you know, to be honest about the scale of what that takes, you're constantly hiring people. There's constantly turnover. So, um, so yeah, all of that said, do your research, think about who you are, where you want to be. And if you're thinking about getting started, go dabble in those areas first before you make any big decisions. Yeah. Um, can, can I also, yeah, say, you know, one thing that I didn't mention, um, is that I, I, Animal Sense is part of a bigger company called Paradise for Paws. And, um, I think working for a, um, a, going in and, and trying, you know, we have, we run a daycare and boarding facility, so you could work there. You could, you can work for a dog walking company because with some of those companies, you get a little bit of education along the way that will also help mm -hmm. you get that education without having to put all of it out um, from yourself, you know, and, but, and you'll also be mm -hmm. around dogs and actually learn a little bit about the business, but you're working at the same time. I think that's an, another mm -hmm. great way to kind of figure out if that's something that you want to go deeper with. Also too, and mm -hmm. to add to that, what about, um, what do you ladies think about going to conference, attending a conference? Yeah. So spending the three or $400 at a conference where you're not a part of that organ, you're not a part of the, uh, the industry necessarily, but being immersing yourself for three or four days over a weekend in a fun new city, meeting a lot of people and picking their brains. I think that's probably um, would be really helpful in every vertical in the pet space, whether it be walking, training, grooming, boarding and daycare, et cetera. They all have their own industry blogging uh, industry, right? Blogging, right? Um, I mean, they all, every aspect of the pet space has its own um, 
its own conference and association and professional association. And that's another thing too. You can join, if you're looking at pet sitting and dog walking, you can join NAPS, the National Association of Professional Pet Sitters. Um, mm -hmm. You can come on Fetch Find, and this is a plug for Fetch Find, but only because it's a great resource. And you can look around, you know, the web, <laughs> you guys are like me. Um, you can look around the website, and we have, you know, stuff about careers on there. You can take one class that's, you know, $25 and do that. And you can go to a meetup in a city that, if you live in a city that has a, a, a very lively and active pet community, you can go to a meetup. Victoria's business does that here in Chicago. She's got pet networking events. So, I mean, the reality is, to everyone's point here and to you, the you know, our audience, our, our people who are looking to make this leap, there are so many things you can do. You can do something where you can go, you know, you can you can you can get a job with PetSmart tomorrow and go through the Grooming Academy and do your year and a half or two years there and walk out as a fully fledged professional. You can go to networking events and learn about the industry. You can go to conferences and trade shows. You can take small classes, big classes. You can go get a PhD in animal behavior, really. I mean, the, 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 the span of opportunities for immersion and education, they're, they're, they're just, they're, they're, it's really kind of infinity plus. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. but we're all here for you. I'm going to speak on behalf of my fabulous friends and guests today and say that if there's something that you would like to talk to Amber or Nicole or Victoria about around their particular vertical training pet sitting, dog walking, and or grooming, I will make those, um, I'll give you their emails, I'll make those available to you. Sorry, ladies, didn't tell you about that, did I? <laughs> um, so, sorry. But that's actually what makes, the reason I didn't even mention it to them is because that really is why these three ladies are here, um, and folks like them who know that part of growing our industry and professionalizing it is to create, to be mentoring and be accessible to people who do want to move into this space and, and following what you know the four of us have done which is to really do it right is important so we are here for you um, and we want to help you and we want to support you and so please think of us fetch find and you know fetch finds friends really as being a resource for you as you start navigating your way through the through the really massive expansive expansive 70 billion dollar pet industry i'll leave you with one more thing um, which is that if you do want to explore the pet industry on July 11th here in Chicago, for those of you who live in Chicago, we're having a really fabulous event. Um, it's from 5.30 to 7.30 in the Merchandise Mart. It's a celebration of pets and innovation, pet industry and innovation and technology. Um, and so if you want information on that, and you can go to Fetch Finds. Facebook page and look under events and find out more information, but it's going to be really amazing. The companies that are going to be there are phenomenal. Our sponsors are amazing. So if you have a chance to do that, actually, I'm going to leave you with more than that. Um, there's more to say than that. And then, um, uh, well, actually, maybe that's like the one thing I want to make sure I, I, I say, but here's the most important thing, which is to thank, um, thank you guys for caring enough about your future and the space itself and the industry itself to spend the hour and five minutes you've already spent listening to us have this conversation and being a part of it where we wouldn't there's no reason to do this except for to do it for you to have to figure out where you fit in in the pet industry um, and to that i want to thank my amazing truly amazing friends and guests for being um, here with me and with us today nicole thank you so much nicole stewart thank you you're welcome it was a pleasure to be here it was really a pleasure to have you victoria thank you so much it's nice to be here. Thanks. Any chance I get to see your beautiful face, I'm always so happy. Mm -hmm. And Amber, we have to take you off of mic. Hold on, because <laughs> thank you. Uh, there you go, thank Amber. You. I really appreciate. I know that you're at work right now, and this was a time that you had to take away from doing what you do. So I'm very grateful. Um, your reputation here in Chicago as being a top-notch groomer, it was really important that we were thank able you. to have you on. Yeah, of course. It was a pleasure. Oh, good. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Um, yeah. Okay, everyone. Okay, I'll look down, look around. Um, <laughs> um, all right, guys. On that note, this will be um, available for viewing. Um, we'll make it available in the PetSmart, in the Fetch Find, everywhere. <laughs> yes. At PetSmart. Um, every time you walk in, right there. Um, we'll make this available all around. And if you have any other additional questions, and I see that there are questions down here. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and end our conversation formally. Um, I see there's a lot of people listening right now. I'm going to go ahead and end our conversation formally. I will invite 
you guys to ask more questions. Um, and I will obviously, if, if Victoria, Amber, or Nicole needs to go, because I know you're all very busy and you were able to fit this in, please, I bid you farewell and thank you so much for coming. But I'm going to stay on for a few more minutes and answer some of the questions that people have logged below and give everyone a chance to ask more if there are some. So I know, Amber, I think you need to get back to grooming. I do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Amber. Have a good day. Um, Hi, um, Nicole. I feel like do you have to get on a plane or something, or you just got back from a plane? No, I just got back. <laughs> just got back. Oh, nice. <laughs> do you need to? Uh, do you need to go? I need to go in about five minutes. Okay. About so, five. and Victoria, what about you, huh? Yeah, yeah, I'm good to stay and answer some questions. Okay, so let's see what we have down below. Let me take a look here. Um, and please now, if you guys want to say stuff. It's so different with only three of us now. No, it does look different. Um, okay, hold on. Let me get to the questions. La, la. I want to know about pet sitting insurance. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure if you're still listening. And Cara um, has offered to answer the question. Yeah, you know what? I am. So, pet sitting insurance. There's a company here um, in the country called the, the Business Carolina Business Insurers of the Carolinas, which is a company. I think Victoria, I assume you use them. Yeah. Um, I don't use them, but I have heard of them, and I know others who do. Um, the one one that we've used, I mean, you can go through uh, like just a general insurance carrier, and you can have them customize it. So we did have like a GL under Travelers for a while. Um, we've also used um, Pet Sitter. I think it's PSI Pet Sitter Associates or something. Yeah, PSI has one like Pet Sitter Associates. Um, so I've I've done multiple over the years. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's it's mostly just important about being covered for you know obviously injuries, like the bite situation, mm -hmm. right, that you talked We're about. Um, we've been lucky that that's only happened once in five years. Um, but I think, generally speaking, there's no right way. Like, there's so many different insurance companies out there. So it's really just figuring out how much coverage you need and finding, you know, the right company. But I do think a, a pet-specific insurance for company sure. is important. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And Kara, I see yeah. our, our friend of Fetch Find, Kara Armour, who is um, really uh, also a very renowned pet sitter and dog walker in the space. Um, and does a lot with education and um, is super, super engaged. She's also been willing to talk about that. So, um, Kara, I think after Nicole goes, maybe if you're still around, I'll invite you to come on screen because I have room for four people. So if you're still around, I will love to bring you on. Um, next question is, um, how to transition from a full-time corporate career to a self-employed self pet professional? Well. Uh, who asked that question? Kathy. Well, Kathy, um, I think we talked about that quite a bit. I'm not sure if I can even, if I even need to answer that question. I think that we covered that uh, a million ways from Sunday. Uh, you heard all the different recommendations from all of these amazing professionals. Um, if you want to follow up with uh, any of us, of course, like I, I've already extended the opportunity and offer to do that. I'll put everyone's email somewhere in this platform so you can get to it. But um, please talk to us and get some guidance and uh, my recommendation would be to for sure check out fetch fine for some for, for some educational tools learn a little bit more um or a lot more and and maybe that would help to um, inspire you for some next steps um next question oh okay so um oh look at there's like all these people commenting um i am so excited right now so linda asked why are we all so awesome why are we all so awesome <laughs> saw that I was like oh, oh come on <laughs> why are we all so awesome Linda why are you can't help it Linda <laughs> you just seriously can't help it all right um Carol let's see exactly what Victoria said just make certain you have all the right coverage oh and look at this what do you know she has a blog that she's written about it okay so I'm gonna um just go ahead and tell everyone to go see what Kara has to say because she really knows her stuff and I respect her perspective and her she does her research she's super sharp um, and a really good friend of mine in Fetch Finds, and I, I, I trust her implicitly. So there's a blog, there's a link to a blog down below. Go ahead and read that. And if you have any more questions, I'm assuming that Carol will make herself available for those. Carol, look at you're like our, but it would like you're like our, you're like our fourth, you're like our fourth, fifth panelist yeah. here, and you don't even know it. Look at that. We just brought you in whether you like it or not. Um, I've had to use insurance. I do. I do want to talk quickly because I think something we didn't cover yeah. on sort of coming from full time to self employed for Kathy's point because we did talk about like getting education, doing those, but I think also just the logistics of it, right? Kind of like how do you balance? Because again, not everybody 
has just a bunch of money sitting in the bank that they can quit their job and try this out. So I would say if you are in a full-time job, don't quit it yet. <laughs> like start, start by doing stuff on the weekends or evenings. So again, maybe getting a part-time job or doing this apprenticeship while you keep your regular job. And then even when you launch the company, I do think, um, you know, depending on what you're doing or if you are an individual, I think it's important to, um, you know, think about how much risk you're willing to take. I think that's what it takes at the end of the day. And I don't know if anyone wants to talk about the risks that they took when they first started their businesses, but it definitely like, if you are going to go full time and pursue it, you know, you have to be willing to take the sort of budget cuts in your day to day life and the financial stress that it takes to take that risk. Listen, that's entrepreneurship in a nutshell, right? If you're looking to change the world and with everybody, I think that starts a business, you're looking to change the world. It's, it could be just the corner of your neighborhood with your bodega, but you're looking to change people's lives through something you're building. And whether that's creating more efficiency in someone's life or comfort or whatever it is, like you're looking to change people and yeah. their experiences. So, and that is hugely risky and you do, you know, I think depending on what you're doing and the scale in which you're doing it, it is, it is about recognizing that unless you have a giant trust fund that you're sitting on or whatever. And if you do, that's awesome because it's still a risk though. I mean, it's still a risk yeah. mm -hmm. because you've got your reputation and you've got your time and you're still risking, yeah. um, but just from at different levels and, and a different scale. Go ahead. Nicole. For the record, um, when I started doing this, when I was going through my apprenticeship um, with Paul, I was waiting tables um, very full time when I was doing it. So I would mm -hmm. um, work at night. I would work in the, I, I will, I would work at the restaurant at night and then I would work during the day um, learning to train dogs. And then when I started working for him, I still kept the waiting tables job. In fact, I had both jobs until I left LA and came back to Chicago. And when I moved here and I decided that I wanted to start my own business, I actually worked part time for an accountant and I worked for him. Uh, like part-time but like 30 hours and then did um, mm -hmm. training at night and training on the weekends until I really felt I'd gotten some momentum and then it's still from part-time to jumping into that was a leap of faith I just went I really assume the clients will come and there was a there was an element of faith that went into it that um, thank, thank goodness panned out quite frankly <laughs> But I mean, but you but it panned did. out. But it was also it was also a, made a lot of a lot of roots. Along yeah, the way. I mean, it wasn't yeah. just like oh, hope this works. It was I really had a pretty good feeling that I had enough business to keep me busy, and to keep me mm -hmm. paid. Yep. Um. Thanks for for sharing that. I think that's a really important and really very real way of it is. Listen, if you're gonna work for yourself. It is a hard every day, but it's a good hard, right? It's not, I mean, and there, listen, there are some days that it feels really hard and not good hard. I mean, there's some days where you feel like, oh my God, what, what have I done? Yeah. Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. What have I done? Um, and I think, you know, Nicole, you work for a larger corporation, but you really run your own, you've run your own business and you've mm -hmm. really been running, you've been an entrepreneur, you know, is what I think they call it, yeah. but you really have been running your own business. Yeah. And you, that's, a, and you, you know, you and I have talked, quite frankly, um, you know, we've talked about, would it be easier to just go get a real corporate job where you weren't having to be in an entrepreneurship role? But I enjoy, I do yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. Um, you know, I really, I really do. Yeah. And that's the thing. You have to enjoy it. I think yeah. you just, I love that you just said that. And yeah. you said it with such like, like just very like, you know, very authentically you enjoy it and you have to enjoy it because owning a company when you're dealing with, you know, all the things that Victoria said earlier, HR and QuickBooks and all of the things, and then you throw in another species on top of it or multiple species. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lot. It's a lot. Um, okay, let's see if there's any other questions. Um, oh, everyone's like loving all your advice. Look at this, Kara. Kara, you're just great advice, Victoria. I worked three other jobs while starting a dog walking company. Yep, I did the same. I worked from Starbucks and then, yeah, and then I worked at Brookstone as a closing manager. Yeah. So, um, you know, what I think the I think the pattern that we're seeing here is that you know people who are the more thoughtful you are about starting working in the pet space as opposed to just jumping in and just crossing your fingers, the more likelihood there is for success. Um, and that's what I'm that's what I'm getting from 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 you guys. Okay, um, I think we are good. Even though I can probably sit here with you all day because I am so love you, ladies. Um, mm -hmm. Now you guys are awesome. You guys are seriously, I'm so happy to be doing this with you and to 
spend this morning with you guys. It's been amazing. I know, Nicole, we were supposed to have a play date tomorrow, but that's going to go or for our kids, not just for you and I. Um, <laughs> but we're going to do that. Those I like a lot, yeah. <laughs> I know, those are fun. <laughs> uh, we'll do that, I think, it sounds like, next weekend. And Victoria, when will I see you? Whenever you want. Are you going to come to the event next Tuesday? Yes, I am. So I'll see you there. Okay, I'll see you at 1871 uh, next Tuesday. Yes. Um, yes. And it's also, that, it's also the holiday weekend that starts in about, I don't know, five, five or six hours for people who don't own companies. Um, yeah. So <laughs> for those yep. of you who uh, can enjoy your holiday weekend without working, you can be with your friend, family and friends, have a safe holiday weekend. As Melanie here, our, one of our team members at Fetch Find, that wrote a beautiful blog the other day and she named it it's national scare the crap out of your pet of your pets weekend <laughs> um, so as That's a quick true. as a quick pet educator comment um, keep your animals inside keep them tagged um, and keep some soft music on and do what you can to protect them from what is sure to be a very loud weekend depending on where you live we all live in Chicago and we know what that means um, and I'm not sure where the rest of you live but there's bound to be fireworks and if you're listening to this to this webcast you for sure have a pet at home so, on that note, happy, healthy 4th of July weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. We have really enjoyed this, and I think we're looking at making this a series um, moving forward because it's really just a great conversation to talk about what it is to really work with pets. Um, I do want to thank my sponsor for this show, which is PetSmart Grooming Academy. Yes, they did sponsor this. Um, they inspired us, I think is probably the better <laughs> way of saying this. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, and again, Amber was not a plant by any chance. This was just a very organic conversation, which is what I promised them, just an organic conversation. If it came up, great. If it didn't, that's okay too. But I feel like it came up and it was meant to come up because I do think that um, starting a career with education, whether it's working for PetSmart or working, you know, working for another organization that allows you for that education, it's super important. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. It's been lovely and amazing. Lovely. We will thank I, you. I, would you guys come back if we want to do this again? Of course. Yeah. Dude. I love right. it. I mean, dude. All right. Cool, I love it too. All right, guys, have a great weekend. Right. Much okay. love. Okay. Bye, 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 everyone. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it.